Yes, yeah, so today, um, you know, I really like this format because it gives us the opportunity to really take an in-focused look um, at Cell Oracle. Um, so this was published work from earlier this year. Um, and in part one, um, I'll be given the primer on the concept of perturbation simulation approaches and really looking at their practical applications. Um, so giving a practical overview of Cell Oracle, um, and really why we designed it and um, the applications. And then in part two, Kenji will take over and really go through a deep dive into the design of Cell Oracle, uh, which we're excited about because there's just so much information in the supplement of that paper um, and really interesting features and observations that we rarely get to um, talk about and discuss. Um, so we're happy to be here. Um, so really coming to the question of why we created Cell Oracle, the biological questions in mind, um, and really taking a step back in the field. Um, so generating you know, masses of single cell data, now moving into single cell multiomics. And this question of have we amassed enough data to model the regulation of cell identity, to model cell behavior, um, and I point you to this fantastic perspective um, from Fabian um, that was published in Cell Systems um, a couple of years ago now, um, that really addressing this question and back in 21, some of the emerging approaches. And I think this field is just exploding now. Um, so one of uh, Fabian's uh, tools that we're particularly um, excited about is SCGen, so predicting single cell perturbation responses. Um, so this is you know, taking cell types and essentially predicting how they will respond to drugs. Um, so using variational autoencoders combined with latent space vector arithmetic to model cellular responses. And what's exciting about SCGen is the prediction of responses in scenarios that are not including, including its training data. So, you know, cell types, they see a drug, how would they respond to that? So, you know, very um, important questions. Um, so thinking less about cellular responses and more moving into predicting changes in cell identity. Um, and, you know, we are really seeing an explosion in this area right now. Um, and just to, you know, touch on a couple, you know, this is not exhaustive at all, but a couple of approaches um, that, that really caught our attention the past couple of years. Um, so prescient, um, a generative modeling framework, uh, so taking time series single cell RNA seq data um, and simulating perturbed cell trajectories within this um, and adapting to complex gene perturbations. Um, and these are really the emerging um, approaches from a, a couple of years ago. Um, and another more local example for you here uh, with Dynamo. Um, so combining single cell RNA-seq, RNA velocity and metabolic labeling, um, and also a touch of simulation of um, gene perturbation outcomes with this. Um, so really moving into this landscape predicting cell identity changes. Um, so this takes us into Cell Oracle. Um, so the core objective of Cell Oracle, and I would put this in the same class as the previous two approaches, um, but definitely a different underlying approach to it. Um, so we aim to simulate changes in cell identity following transcription factor perturbation here. So the key question is how transcription factors regulate cell identity. And I'll come through to the practical applications of this. Um, we would like to stress that this is not about GRN inference. Um, cell Oracle uses GRN, GRN inference to simulate changes in cell identity, but it's not about GRN inference itself. And at the end of this primer, I will touch on the need for data sets for proper benchmarking of these approaches. Um, and hopefully we can have a fun discussion around that. Um, so to start off with this primer, um, so really kind of taking in, um, you know, the overall concept of Cell Oracle, how it's built, and then Kenji is going to, you know, leap off from there and, and really go into a lot of the technical details. Um, with Cell Oracle, our key goal is to dissect cell identity, but we do this by a, a novel network inference approach. We come from the perspective of gene regulatory networks because these are the master regulators of cell identity. And as I'll show you in the applications, um, really the core focus of the lab is how do we manipulate cell identity through transcription factor overexpression. So um, this was an ideal starting point uh, that Kenji took the project from. And that we use single cell RNA-seq and attack-seq data to infer gene regulatory networks for each cluster within a data set. 
And then we can ask how gene regulatory networks change during reprogramming differentiation or development across a cell biological process. Um, and I'll give a small example of this at the end. Uh, but again, it's less about the GRNs. It's really how about transcription factors regulate cell identity. So hopefully I'm not laboring this point too much, um, but it's an important distinction. In the first step of Cell Oracle, we build a base gene regulatory network. Um, so a lot of the GRN approaches uh, classically have produced these chaotic hairballs um, where you're looking at transcription factor interacting with all other genes. Um, and you know, what Kenji decided to do here is take single cell attack seq data um, and build a base GRN network that represents all the biologically feasible connections within a network. Um, so from the single cell attack seq data using Cicero, um, we identify accessible promoter enhanced DNA sequences, scan these regulatory elements for transcription factor binding motifs. And then this produces a list of all the potential regulatory um, connections. And so this was inspired by Scenic, um, and I'll come back to Scenic as a comparable at the end of this primer. The result of this is the base gene regulatory network. And we now have base GRNs for at least 10 different species, I believe, and this is growing. Um, we get frequent requests on GitHub to add um, more exotic species by the day, which is fun. Now in step two, so we have this base GRN, GRN for the species. In step two, for each cell type, so for each cluster um, within the, your single cell RNA-seq data set, we want to identify the connections in that network that are actually active. Um, so Kenji builds a regularized machine learning model that predicts transcription factor target gene relationships. Um, from the ML model fitting results, it presents the certainty of connection as a distribution. And this allows us to remove the weak or inactive connections from the base GRN, leaving us with the cell type and state specific GRN configuration. And then in step three, so this is really the core of cell oracle. This is the unique um, and creative aspect. So we use this ML model that predicts target gene relationships, um, TF target gene relationships to simulate the effects of transcription factor perturbation. And so then we propagate this initial perturbation um, within the GRN to simulate the indirect uh, global transcriptional effects. And then Cell Oracle produces a simulated gene expression matrix. And so we're effectively pr predicting how cells will shift in identity in response to transcription factor perturbation. Um, and I'm gonna go through exactly what we were predicting here um, and the novel biology that, that we found from this. Um, but the core output of cell oracle are these small scale shifts in cell identity, so these vectors. Um, so in terms of validation, um, so I'm really gonna cover a lot of the validation today and hopefully um, we, can, we can use that as a point of discussion. Um, so you know the core output of cell oracle, as I said, are these, these vectors, but then how do we begin to interpret these within a dynamic biological system? Um, so the first point of validation, we turn to mouse hematopoiesis. Um, so it's been so well characterized, we know generally how transcription factors behave in that system. Um, so we turn to this single cell atlas of myeloid progenitor differentiation that was published in 2015 uh, from Ido Amat's lab. And so we see here progenitor differentiation down into granulocytes, monocytes, and down the erythroid lineage. And um, so we can project wild type cell density onto this atlas, but in this paper, they also had knockout for CBP alpha um, and demonstrated as expected, CBP alpha blocks granulocyte and monocyte specification from these initial differentiation stages. Now this core RI in particular, it was a classic knockout. Um, it was very rigorous analysis of this knockout as well. Um, and I'd love to get into some discussion um, toward the end of this talk about some of our adventures in PerturbSeq um, to generate ground truth data um, to really validate cell oracle, the limitations of this approach, and you know, maybe some of the future directions. Um, but at this point for us, like having these classic straight up knockouts um, and validated knockouts was essential. And so getting into the cell oracle prediction of these knockout phenotypes, Sorry, this is published, it's not unpublished, that's snuck in there. Um, so as I said, we have to understand the output of cell oracle in the context of natural differentiation of a system. 
Um, so when we take this um, atlas of myelopoiesis, um, we can look at the differentiation as a gradient of pseudotime. And then we combine this with the cell oracle CBP alpha knockout simulation. So here we're effectively calculating the inner product um, of the differentiation and the knockout simulation. And it produces a cell density prediction in the CBP alpha knockout sample. And just by way of a little bit of backstory here, um, when we first presented Cell Oracle with these uh, short range um, shifts in cell light density, um, people were really struggling with their interpretation. Um, so, you know, so how do you, in a systematic way, begin to interpret the output of Cell Oracle? Um, so it really led on this long journey, um, and you know, Kenji did some really creative work with this to think about how do we rank transcription factors by you know, the degree of impact on cell phenotype? Um, and this, this was part of that journey and, um, and really I think helps users rank transcription factor uh, knockouts in a systematic way. And I'll go into the systematic <laughs> perturbations um, that we've been performing. Um, so in this cell density prediction, um, we have these areas in red where the differentiation vectors are working in the same direction as the knockout simulation vectors. And so we predict in these areas that differentiation might accelerate, um, but certainly we don't predict that differentiation would slow down or reverse. The areas in blue, the perturbation effect is working against differentiation. So we're predicting that differentiation would decelerate, uh, it may stop, it may go into reverse as well. So cells begin reverting back to their um, original identities. Now it's really important to note here that we do not aim to predict the exact changes in cell identity um, following perturbation simulation. I think that is an incredibly, incredibly difficult task. Also, we don't aim to predict, you know, if you transcription, the perturbed transcription factor on day zero, and then you've got all these bifurcations to a differentiated cell product on day four, we don't aim to simulate those long range changes in cell identity or long term changes in cell identity. So this is, you know, really a short term basis. Um, and I'll give some examples on the strengths of this um, and how we can effectively you know, generate a series of you know, thousands of conditional knockouts um, along each lineage. And um, so we cover this in detail in the paper, how we predict um, this phenotype, so how the differentiation and simulation um, vectors interact. Um, and we came up with this, con co this concept of the perturbation score, which I'll get into in detail, um, and how this changes um, cell density within a differentiation or reprogramming process. Um, I'm also going to be going into detail about how we validated this in the context of zebrafish embryogenesis, um, so specifically axial mesoderm formation. Um, in the paper, we go through a lot of validation in mouse and human hematopoiesis and also in zebrafish development. And I'll be giving a little bit of insight and backstory into why we chose those systems. Um, so first of all, in terms of predicting cell density changes, so we wanted to make this, we wanted to make cell oracle as accessible as possible, but also to provide insight into a biological process um, in as you know, just a really easy approachable way and help people interpret the data in the most unbiased way possible. Um, so here we have some simulated data. Um, so this is a progenitor that would bif bifurcate to two terminal Thermally differentiated cell identities. Um, so we have our pseudotime project projected, our gradient of pseudotime re represented as this vector field. And then we place some cells in our initiation area in the Monte Carlo simulation here. And then we let them differentiate over time. And you see, we simulate that these cells would move down either branch, um, and then we ha would have accumulation of cell density at the end of this process. Now we get into predicting cell density following transcription factor perturbation. So these are really important points about how cell oracle works and how we generate these perturbation scores. And so we start with our pseudotime gradient and we introduce our perturbation. Um, so this will be a negative perturbation. So the knockout of the transcription factor here, this is the core output of cell oracle is predicting that these vectors are working against the natural differentiation of the system. 
Um, so we have this negative perturbation score in this area. And from the diffusion simulation results, we will predict that cells accumulate at this bifurcation point. Um, so we would really essentially be preventing differentiation from this transcription factor knockout. Now compare this to the next example where we have a positive perturbation score. Um, and we focus mainly on these negative perturbation scores, but I would love to get into more discussion about the positive scores today, because I think there's some interesting biology to be learned today. Um, biology to be learned there, but it's very, very difficult to validate. Um, so say if we have a positive perturbation score down one of these branches, we would predict that uh, differentiation might be accelerated down this branch. So we'd get more accumulation of cells than one branch um, of the differentiation trajectory. Um, so getting into the validation of cell oracle with the CBP alpha knockout ground truth data. Um, so cell oracle predicts that we will lose differentiation um, down these differentiated lineages here uh, to granulocytes um, and accumulation of cells within these progenitor states. And that's exactly what we see in the ground truth data. Um, cell oracle also predicts that there might be a slight acceleration down the erythroid branch and we do see accumulation of cells down the erythroid um, branch as well, which is, which is interesting. And um, we also see that cell oracle, so you can kind of make out here some of these positive, um, some of these vectors kind of shooting down um, this differentiated lineage. Um, so suggesting that if we knocked out CBP alpha in later stages, we would see an acceler acceleration in differentiation. Um, so this is something I'll come back to later. So we see it in quite, um, we see it quite frequently in differentiation systems. Obviously, we would need a conditional knockout of CBP alpha down this lineage um, to be able to test this hypothesis. Um, so CBP epsilon was another ground truth knockout uh, data set that they included in this paper and cell oracle predicts accumulation um, of cells in these progenitor states. And this is exactly um, what we see in the ground truth data from the paper. Um, so the, you know, this extremely um, valuable um, um, data sets for us to use. Um, so in general, coming away from the CBP alpha transcription factors, how can we look more globally and validate cell oracle? Um, so Kenji performed a knockout simulation in each lineage, um, so down the mega megakaryocyte erythroid lineage, down the granulocyte monocyte lineage, and then calculated the sum of the negative perturbation scores. And I'll come into more detail uh, with our zebrafish example of how we begin to rank transcription factors in this manner. Um, but then this is quite a busy plot, but from this data, we predicted the phenotypes of um, all transcription factors that we could knock out in this system um, and then went to the literature. And overall, we found 85% of cell oracle predict predictions were supported by published phenotypes. And um, so this was one aspect of the validation. So rather than going through hematopoiesis and generating the single cell knockout data um, for each transcription factor itself, um, we turned to the literature. Um, so from this starting point, you know, hematopoiesis is, is so well-defined. Um, how do we kind of get into more novel biology? You know, how do we more systematically validate cell oracle? Um, so we turned to zebrafish development. Um, so there was this, you know, beautiful atlas of zebrafish development published by uh, Jeff Farrell and Alex Shear in 2018 um, and contains, you know, all the differentiating um, cell types as the zebrafish embryos um, differentiate. And this was a great opportunity for us to perform knockout simulations for all transcription factors. So it's systematically all transcription factors with inferred connections to at least one other gene um, and performing this across zebrafish development. Um, so Kenji built a website um, for this. Um, so cell, uh, celloracle.org. And um, you can explore all of these uh, knockout predictions there. And essentially this led to the discovery of new phenotypes and new regulators of axial mesoderm development. Now axial mesoderm development has been studied um, very exhaustively. Um, in the nineties, there were a lot of um, mutation screens performed in this context. Um, so very, very well characterized and the challenge here is from these new methods, can you actually learn some new biology about these systems? And I think that's what we, what we should be aiming for. So really, if we've developed a useful tool, it should give us new biological insights. 
Um, so to take um, a deeper dive into this, uh, we decided we can't look at every lineage across zebrafish development. It's too, it's too much. Also, our collaborators wouldn't be happy with that, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, so we specifically looked at axial mesoderm formation. Um, so axial mesoderm is a really important patterning structure in zebrafish development, and it bifurcates into the notochord and the precordal plates. So we've got this really nice lineage bifurcation to look at here, and we can calculate the pseudotime gradient. Um, we can also perform network analysis, um, which I don't touch on too much today, but I'm certainly happy to discuss that. Um, looking at degree centrality, so the absolute number of genes that a tra transcription factor is connecting to, along the axial mesoderm lineage, we see that NOTO is our top transcription factor. NOTO is a classic regulator of notochord differentiation. Um, so these results were reassuring to see. And um, so the next step was, well, let's knock out, let's do the knockout simulation for NOTO. Do we see what we would expect? And we see exactly what has been reported, well, almost exactly what's been reported in the literature. So we knock out NOTO in silico, we see loss of, um, loss of the not notochord predicted, fantastic. But we also see that cells are redirected down the precordal plate and cell oracle is predicted that cells will accumulate in the precordal plate. Um, so looking back at the original NOTO knockout public, um, publication, so the floating head mutant, uh, back in the 90s, um, reported a expansion of the precordal plate. That's not reported, um, but they did report that the notochord converts to somites in the system. So there's kind of a trans differentiation there. Um, so this was really a novel phenotype for this classic knockout. Um, also, when we read back through this, um, this paper, um, we could see evidence that the precordal plate was expanding in these embryos, but it just never had been reported or noted. Um, so based on these results, um, so I presented these probably in 2020 initially, and people in the zebrafish field said, okay, you have to validate that. We don't believe it. Um, and also it's a really interesting observation because nobody you know, has reported this since the 90s. Um, so we set about with our collaborators, um, so at WashU, Lila Solnick, Kretzel, and um, Lisa Stringer, um, to recreate a high resolution um, atlas of notochord and precordal plate differentiation. Um, so we can see um, these two branches to these uh, terminally differentiated cell types or toward terminal differentiation. Um, and we see in the floating head mutant cells, so this is with the noto knockout, that we lose notochord differentiation as expected, but we do see accumulation of cells down the precordal plate, so exactly as cell oracle predicted. So cells have been you know, re-diverted in this process, a complete loss of notochord um, and also loss of cells in these early notochord stages. So really this lineage switch. And I think this you know, highlights some of the benefits of cell oracle with these short range vectors um, that we can really see when we would get these lineage switches. Um, but the challenge here is how do you start interpreting these data sets? So rather than you know, looking at these vectors and um, you know, trying to you know, find the novel biology, how do you start scoring candidate regulators in an unbiased way? So um, this was a really important end goal for us. Um, so to do this, we took the pseudotime, um, so the perturbation score, and plotted that over pseudotime. Um, so you see for the NOTO knockout here that in the early stages of axial um, mesoderm differentiation, we're calculating a negative perturbation score. So cell oracles predicting that differentiation will be inhibited. So these um, perturbation vectors are working against the natural differentiation of the system. And um, we're also predicting here, and we don't discuss this much, that later in notochord development, we're predicting if we knocked out noto later in differentiation stages, that differentiation would actually be accelerated. And I think this is one of the benefits of cell oracle that we're essentially calculating, um, making thousands of predictions that almost act like uh, conditional knockouts in silico. Uh, for comparison here, um, we have a gene, um, so we knocked it out in silico, we don't report any phenotype, and we've seen no reports of phenotypes in the literature. Um, so we calculate the sum of this negative IP score, uh, we transform it, and this gives us our prioritized candidate notochord regulators. 
So these are the transcription factors that we're, and here we're focusing solely on this negative IP score just to simplify the process. Um, I think delving into the positive scores um, will be certainly be follow-up work. Uh, but looking at these negative IP scores, we're really taking or predicting the transcription factors who, you know, when we perturb the factors, we will lose differentiation down a specific trajectory. And so this is specifically down um, the nosocore differentiation trajectory. And in red here are known regulators of notochord formation, and in black are the regulators, the potential regulators that have never been described to have a role in notochord formation. Um, so we teamed up with Leela Solnaka Kretzel's lab, um, and Leela in the 90s performed a lot of these mutant screens in zebrafish. Um, she's also the chair of my department, so um, you know, really handy to have Leela uh, locally in this. Uh, so we presented these results to her and said, you know, hey, will you help us perform the knockouts? And Zebrafish is a great um, model system for, for these kind of knockouts. We can generate crispants um, relatively easy, I'd say. Um, relatively easy, Leela said, I will give you three genes uh, to validate in, in this system um, because it is a lot of work. So she said, okay, from these candidate regulators, pick three. Um, so we didn't simply just pick the top three uh, ranked regulators on this list. Um, we were a little bit more careful um, about it than that. Um, the way we narrowed down these regulators, first of all, we looked for regulators whose res uh, expression was restricted to the notochord lineage. So then we're not starting to predict or you know, starting to look at any pleiotropic um, effects outside of the lineage. Um, so this is specific for this validation. Um, also, we looked at regulators that were highly connected within their networks. Um, so with the thinking that um, the more highly connected a gene is, the more reliable um, its um, perturbation simulation would be. Um, and this left, left us with three candidate regulators. So it was IRX3, uh, CBOX, which is on their summit. Yep, their CBOX, and LHX1A. Um, so just to be fully transparent um, about why we picked these regulators. Um, so focusing specifically on LHX1A, so all three candidate regulators checked out, um, but LHX1A um, for us specifically was interesting. Um, so we predicted that when we knock out LHX1A, that we would lose differentiation down the notochord and precordal plate lineages, and we might get a few cells sneaking down onto this notochord differentiation lineage. And so again, actually generating the ground truth data, um, so using these, um, you know, generating the LHX1A crispants, um, we do see a loss of cells, so an increase of cells in these early progenitor stages, um, and also a loss of cells down the precordal plate. Um, we also see a significant loss of cells down the notochord lineage as well. And so this nicely validated um, the, the predictions from cell oracle, um, but also what was really exciting to us is we'd found a novel regulator of axial mesoderm differentiation. And this process has been studied to death since the 90s. Um, so this, this was uh, really the goal for us. Can we find some novel biology? Um, in terms of what LHX1A is doing in this context, well, obviously we have the single cell RNA-seq data from these, um, um, these knockout crispants. Um, so we could assess this data and we found that the anti-dorsalizing morphogenetic protein, um, so ADMP, is upregulated in the LHX1A crisp crispants. And we know from the literature that AM ADMP antagonism promotes not notochord formation. Um, so we think we have a little bit of mechanistic insight from this. Um, and we also, in the paper, um, went through and did some orthogonal uh, validation of the single cell RNA-seq results. Um, so to start wrapping up, um, my part of the talk, really thinking about some more practical applications for beyond this validation. Um, so, you know, really, why did we generate, or why did we develop cell oracle in the first place? And what are the big questions that are specific to my lab? Um, why we are interested in dissecting gene regulatory networks is because we want to manipulate them for the purposes of cellular reprogramming. Um, so I gave my talk here um, um, a few weeks ago and really made this point that cellular reprogramming has failed to recapitulate target cell identity. 
Um, so we have these two main strategies, directed differentiation and direct linear tree programming. And we have problems with both. So with directed differentiation, the resulting cells are developmentally immature. And with direct reprogramming, we see that starting cell identity persists, and yet the resulting cells remain developmentally immature. And direct reprogramming is often achieved, or most typically achieved, by a transcription factor overexpression. Um, and so if we can predict new transcription factor cocktails um, using methods such as cell oracle, um, then hopefully we can get closer to that target cell identity. Um, and this is really important um, in terms of regenerative medicine, because the practical utility of these engineered cells is limited. They're essentially developmental um, intermediates. They don't have full adult function. Um, so we want to understand how we can deconstruct cell identity to increase reprogramming efficiency and fidelity. Um, so this takes us to really wanting to understand how transcription factors control differentiation and reprogramming. And our prototypical lineage conversion is IEP reprogramming. We take mouse embryonic fibroblasts, um, overexpress FOXA1, HNFR alpha, and convert them to induced hepatocytes. Um, and a paper um, I published almost 10 years ago now, um, we showed that these cells do have hepatic identity, but they also have this underlying intestinal identity. Um, we renamed the cells induced endoderm progenitors, um, but this was a surprise that they had such broad potential. And to cut a long story short, it's signaling that the transcription factors we're using for these reprogramming methods are not behaving in the way we would like them to. And I think it signals that these transcription factor cocktails are incomplete. So how do we start discovering new factors to add to these cocktails? And um, we took you know, a close look at this protocol with our cell tagging methods. Um, so through generating ground truth lineage tracing information, we were able to define these two trajectories. I uh, want to a reprogrammed state. So these are the cells that successfully engraft the intestine and one into this dead end mesenchymal like state. So this off target reprogramming um, byproduct, and it reduces the efficiency with which we can generate our target cell type. Um, so my main point here is like from this mouse embryonic fibroblast state, we have these two trajectories, one to epithelial reprogrammed and one to mesenchymal dead end. Um, so this is what brings us back to our cell oracle analysis now. And sorry, this was published in uh, stem cell reports earlier this year. Um, so we have these two clear trajectories and this is what you need, um, the ideal data you need um, to, to start working with cell oracle and Kenji. Uh, we'll be um, delving into some of this. Um, so from these two clear tra tra trajectories to reprogram and dead end, the question here is how do we pull cells away from the dead end trajectory and shift them onto this reprogramming trajectory? Um, so if you think about the zebrafish uh, validation, and that was just naturally looking at this bifurcation, um, what transcription factors were involved in this, but now we want to start engineering these bifurcations. Um, so it's a fun application. Uh, so we calculate our reprogramming pseudotime and calculate the inner product uh, with the simulated perturbation vector field and generate our perturbation scores. And we did this systematically. So for every transcription factor within these networks, we performed these knockout simulations. And this allowed us to identify novel regulators of this reprogramming process. So I've been studying this reprogramming process for the past 15 years. Um, again, Cell Oracle came up with some novel candidates. Um, so all of these candidates um, checked out. Um, so for example, here we are simulating the effects of FOXD2 knockout. We see when we knock out FOXD2, cell oracles predicting that reprogramming will be blocked and cells are re-diverted down the dead end lineage. Um, and this is what we've been able to validate. So this is in another paper, if we look at the ID1 results here. Um, so this is colony formation assay validation. We see that we lose this reprogrammed population when we knock out um, sorry, knocked down ID1 in this case. Um, so all of these hits we were able to functionally validate. Um, but then if we flip this and say, okay, so we know when we knock out these transcription factors, we lose the reprogram population. How does this help us identify new factors to add to the cocktail to get to that reprogram state? Um, so this is where we dig a little bit more into the GRN analysis. Um, so we look at our top 50 inferred FOSS targets in this case. And this was an interesting analysis because we found in the, these top 50 targets, direct targets of YAP1. So this is a downstream effector of the hippo sigma pathway. 
And we know from the literature that there's an interaction between FOSS and YAP1. Um, AP1, um, so this is via AP1, which is required for liver overgrowth caused by YAP overexpression. So there's a really nice link between the liver, YAP, and FOSS, um, peaked our interest. And um, so we ended up adding YAP and FOSS to our HNF4 alpha FOX A1 reprogramming cocktail and, and significantly increase um, the number of reprogrammed cells that we can generate in this assay. Um, and this was one of the most impressive results in terms of um, in improving reprogramming efficiency that I've seen, um, you know, working with these cells over the past 15 years. Um, and the cells have this you know, really strange phenotype and happy to discuss that more. Um, but this is really just a small vignette of how we can gain more insight into cell engineering using cell oracle. Um, so now thinking about the broader applications of cell oracle, um, so this was a paper published in Science that used Cell Oracle before Cell Oracle had actually been published itself. Um, so this group um, in Italy saw the Cell Oracle preprint. Pre um, Kenji, you know, had everything up on GitHub um, before its final publication, and I think that was, you know, really a benefit to the community, but also a benefit to us as well. Um, so in this context, um, this group were looking at a coding and long non-coding sing single cell atlas of the developing human fetal striatum. And they were predicting transcription factors um, that would, that would um, play a role in development of um, fetal striatum. The challenge here was it was in the developing human fetus. Um, in this case, they didn't feel that they had any you know, very good models um, in vitro to be able to test this. Um, so they ended up using cell oracle to validate um, in silico, some of the candidates um, they were putting uh, forward for um, medium spiny neuron maturation, I think it was in that paper. Um, so this is an example of how you can use these in silico approaches to start probing biology in systems that are otherwise inaccessible. Uh, more recently, uh, we teamed up with another group, WashU, um, so working on human patient samples to define cardiac functional recovery. Um, so finding or predicting factors in that context um, that would pr promote functional recovery. So again, in inaccessible human systems where we don't have very good stem cell models um, to recapitulate these in vitro. And as I said, just a little bit ago in my talk, I, th I think these stem cell models are very challenging. Um, we can start to make some um, novel biological insights. And then our recent stem cell reports paper, the application of cell oracle, um, to direct lineage reprogramming. Um, so just to start wrapping up now, um, thinking about some limitations of cell oracle, and um, we can discuss this more um, in Kenji's talk as well. Uh, so first of all, we focus on transcription factors. Um, we're looking at these gene regulatory networks. Um, for us, we want to focus on transcription factors, um, but I think it's also very important to consider cell signaling, um, you know, other gene sets as well. And we can only perturb individual transcription factors. Um, so cell oracle is based on a linear model. Um, we can also discuss that in more detail in Kenji's talk. Um, but ideally, we as a field can get toward the perturbation of multiple transcription factors at the, at the same time. This is not trivial at all. I think it's an extremely, extremely complex problem um, that we need to address. Um, limitation, the application to intact trajectories. So cell oracle is, you know, really at its strongest when we're working with these complete intact differentiation trajectories. So with the myelopoiesis, um, with the zebrafish differentiation, with these intact reprogramming trajectories, um, you know, it really, cell oracle needs to have seen the data to be able to make these predictions. It can't predict a jump to some, you know, unknown cell type that has not been uh, previously observed by cell oracle. Uh, in terms of reprogramming, there's very specific limitations um, that I think you know, help illustrate of, you know, where you can best apply cell oracle. So in terms of reprogramming, um, in normal development, I think it's very rare to knock out a transcription factor and create a novel cell identity. Development is heavily canalized. Um, we haven't seen any examples of where you would create a novel cell identity upon transcription factor knockout. Reprogramming, on the other hand, we are overexpressing transcription factors at non-physiological levels outside of their normal context. 
the creation of a novel cell identities in this context is, um, you know, is very, very likely. Um, again, if cell oracle hasn't seen, hasn't um, assayed those cell types, then it, it, it cannot predict, um, you know, um, um, it cannot make predictions toward those cell types. Um, so happy to discuss, it, discuss these limitations in more detail. Um, in terms of comparables, so just to highlight Scenic Plus, um, so as I said in the introduction, so the generation of the base gene regulatory network um, is really inspired um, by Scenic uh, from Stein Ertz lab. Um, and now with Scenic Plus, um, you know, really the, the benefit with Scenic Plus is they're using um, these curated motifs, so over 30,000 cu curated motifs for improved transcription factor um, motif identification. Um, and now they include the effects of transcription factor perturbations with scenic plus. Um, so again, this is specifically network-based. So I'd say there's two, probably two classes of perturbation simulation algorithms right now um, that work within that gene regulatory network space. Um, so I'd say cell oracle and scenic, um, the field is moving really fast. Um, so I think there's kind of more added every day at the moment. Um, and just to leave you with some final thoughts on benchmarking. Um, so particularly with Scenic Plus, um, they perform benchmarking in this paper, um, but they benchmark the gene regulatory network inference. Um, I think it is essential as we move forward with in silico perturbation methods, um, not to, I think it's important to underlie, you know, benchmark those underlying um, parts of the algorithms, but we need to be able to benchmark the final output. So as I said, the core output of Cell Oracle are these predictions of shifts in cell identity, that's what we need to be benchmarking. Um, and we're just not getting there as a field yet. Um, what are the best data sets for benchmarking? And I alluded to this earlier that we you know, delved into um, PerturbSeq to be able to do this. And we have some of the PerturbSeq um, results in the stem cell reports paper. Um, but for us, it was the straight up validated knockouts um, that provided the best benchmarking data sets. And as we move forward in this field and we have more algorithms emerging, um, we will have to perform um, comprehensive benchmarking. And so we need accompanying comprehensive ground truth data sets um, for perturbation data. And I really think validated perturbations um, that we can use for these benchmarking efforts. And um, I honestly think we're a few years away from this yet and happy to discuss this more. Uh, so in summary, before we take a break and then I hand to Kenji, um, so I've really you know, presented the, the concepts of cell oracles so simulating these cell identity changes um, following transcription factor perturbation. Um, it's based on a new model for network inference, but we are more focused on these perturbation simulations. Um, we've extensively validated the method and hopefully my walkthrough today is um, a good primer for Kenji's talk. Um, and shown some practical applications on how we view cell oracle to identify new factors to increase reprogramming efficiency, um, but also to find some novel factors controlling, regulating zebrafish embryogenesis. Um, so just to wrap up this part, um, this primer, as a thank to lab, um, particularly Kenji, um, and you know, excited for him to give his talk next. Um, and particularly our collaborators, Leela and Blursa on the zebrafish project. Um, and I'd love to take any questions that we have now um, and also happy to wait after Kenji's talk as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having us. I'm really excited to talk about the method section. So usually like um, in the same like conference or seminar, we have not talked about the detail of the, you know, such um, design philosophy or something. I'm really excited to talk about the untold story in the Oracle algorithm. So um, today I want to talk about like um, these topics. So for, for the you know, for first, let me like, uh, give you a brief recap about the goal of the research. And I want to also talk about the philosophy of the method design. I mean, like how do I design the cell Oracle or why I did that? So. And then, of course, I will talk about the, you know, uh, kind of actual implementation of the cell oracle. So, and then I, in, including some variation or I mean, some kind of like a analysis of the cell oracle itself. Um, finally, 
I also want to talk about the basic assumption and limitation of the cell oracle from the viewpoint of method um, or algorithm design. So, um, okay, let's get started. So um, the first, uh, again, so uh, in, as Sam mentioned in her talk, we are interested in the cell identity regulation or kind of like a developmental process. You know, in the developmental process, single cell differentiate into many kinds of cell types. And then each cell have like a unique, unique identity and a unique gene expression program. So we are interested in how such unique cell identities are um, established, um, maintained, and organized. So for each state, we expect like a, there exists each unique molecular um, mechanism or gene expression regulatory system. So we want to understand what's going on and to, you know, to control such cell identity. And we want to make a computational model to understand such um, regulatory system. Also, I'm really interested in kind of system biology, um, system biology. And we want to rebuild the mechanism from like a system biology perspective. Okay, um, so the, maybe I will talk, uh, I will start with the, start talking about the philosophy of method design. So in this, in the, in the Oracle, we are like focusing on these three points, I guess. Um, today, I gonna talk about these three points. So first, um, what I wanna say is we are really focusing on the simulation. So like Sam said in her presentation, we, you know, maybe we, we are making emphasis on the simulation rather than like a uh, inference itself. Um, but, and then the second point is like, uh, we are trying to, I'm trying to do, um, I'm trying to break a big challenge down into the practical, more practical tasks. Um, the finally, the, the important point is that we are trying to incorporate many biological information or biological domain knowledge. So because we, um, I'm kind of, kind of like, a, I have a hybrid background. Like I have competition, computation training, and also I have training in the like development of biology or cell engineering. So I try to use these both expertise like from statistical or data, data science skill and biological skill both. Um, before talking about first philosophy, Please let me briefly um, talk about the like a uh, kind of background of the network science or gene regulatory network science to clarify what we want to do. So uh, I think the most of the audience in this room is like a, you know doing kind of like a network inference or modeling or something like that, I guess. Um, so if we talk about network science network science, or I mean, if we say like gene regulatory network, maybe many people imagine like this is the study of the gene regulation based on kind of like a biological data. I mean, people try to infer the biological um, network based on some kind of um, experimental data, right? Um, but the kind of important point here is we cannot observe the gene regulatory network itself directly. Um, so usually we will need to use some kind of gene, or gene data or molecular data. Um, like if you look at the microscope, we cannot see the network, right? Um, but uh, um, so in this sense, we are trying to infer some kind of what uh, network, which is what we want to know. But we, what we can see is just like a shadow of the data. So usually we can look at the shadow and then we are trying to infer the you know, the network or kind of mechanism behind the um, experimental data. So, um, and some people try to use like a statistical method or data science method or something like that. Um, another point is uh, kind of related point is, like I said, we cannot directly see the network itself. And then we can observe some different stuff like uh, expression data or protein protein interaction data or something like that. So, which means if we say uh, gene regulatory network, which means many things, right? If people are focusing on the chip seq data, maybe GRN inference might um, remind you some kind of chip seq information. But if somebody 
when I use like a gene expression data, maybe somebody in, um, guess like a gRNA requires like a, a high um, high dimensional um, RNA seq data or like that. So I will not say like every gRNA meaning might be different depending on the person or depending on the system they are using. So here in our method, we are focusing on transcriptional um, gene regulatory network, which means we are really focusing on the transcription regulation. And so here we are um, not using the information about like, let's say protein protein interaction, um, but I mean, here we are using like a transcription information. Okay, the first thing I want to say is like a, we are focusing on simulation prediction. So based on the biological data, I say like a, which is kind of shadow, we are trying to infer the network or biological circuit behind the data. So which is kind of like a reverse engineering step, right? So based on the data, kind of like a combining some experimental data, we are trying to infer the biological circuit behind the, um, you know, um, behind the phenomenon. And then this is kind of reverse engineering step. So we are trying to decode the biological circuit behind the you know, experimental data. In the first step, we are trying to infer the biological circuit uh, or biological network. So which is, you know, uh, which is kind of blueprint of the, our biological system. Uh, but the next step is maybe most important process for the cell oracle. I mean, if, so here we have some assumption if we say we understand the biological circuit or biological network, we should be able to predict the behavior, actual biological behavior. So this is what we uh, are, this is the, our assumption. So like by predicting the biological behavior, maybe we can also do the manipulation of the cell or manipulation of kind of like a um, tissue using such simulation model. Um, and then, so we can do like a cell engineering or tissue regeneration study. Um, so this is what we try to do now. Um, maybe, uh, you know, we can say like uh, using the Richard Feynman's words, but I cannot create, I do not understand. So we, by, um, by predicting or by simulating the behavior, we try to demonstrate the, you know, our understanding level. So this is uh, why we are, really focusing on the prediction or simulation. So not only just uh, you know, inferring the biological circuit, but also we are trying to predict and simulate actual biological behavior. So which is, in, which is more like a strong way to show our understanding and which is like a um, good way to um, you know, applying our knowledge into actual biological question. Okay, um, so we are like, you know, we are say, uh, so, like I said, uh, we we are focusing on the you know, biological network simulation. So simulation based on the biological network. So this is like application centric uh, network analysis. So, for example, if we look at the biological network, like yes, maybe it's kind of hard to understand what's going on. You know, uh, the virus, because the biological network is really complex, and then. Um, Sometimes we can do some graph analysis and then we can know the, we can interpret what's going on. But if, for example, if we just take a look at such network structure, does it make sense? Maybe, maybe not, at least to me. And then if we start thinking about the biological behavior based on the network, it's more intu intuitive. We can more intuitively understand what's going on. And so maybe I can say there are some advantages so first, by designing network as a pre predictive computational model, so we can interpret the meaning of the complex network. So this is like a, you know, a kind of for interpretation, uh, the simulation is really useful. And then second, this also simulation can be a variable tool for uh, fundamental biological research and cell engineering. So in the previous section, some talk about the uh, application of cell oracle into the cell engineering. Like that, we can do in silico simulation and maybe we can apply cell oracle to many kinds of biological system so that we can do like kind of scalable in silico analysis, in silico perturbation analysis. 
But the third point, also really important to me, I mean, the simulation task will guide us to design the network architecture. So what does it mean? So this is the overview of the Cell Oracle framework. So in the first step, we will use single cell RNA sequencing data. Also, we will use single cell attack seq data. So um, each, uh, sorry, each, in each process, we can process the data and sequentially. So first, we will construct GRN gene regulatory network. And then using the GRN model, we will do like a simulation or computational analysis. And then last part, we will do like um, cell, cell fate simulation and then visualize a result as a vector field. Um, this is like a data processing, processing from, from left to right. But actually when I think, or when I design the core network, I designed for really focusing on the last part. And then for the last part, we are trying to do simulation. Then for simulation, what kind of network we, what kind of, sorry, what kind of calculation we need to do. And then we, I designed that uh, sim, such simulation process. And then for the, for the in silico gene perturbation simulation, what kind of GRN um, information do we need? And then we designed this step one. So, I mean, for the um, data processing, we start from left to right. But actually, when we think about the method design, I design from like a right side to left side. Thing. Because if we think about network simulation, which define the, you know, the implementation of the previous step. And then, so we design the, like everything in the you know, dark world. So um, maybe this process is like, I, uh, sorry, uh, another kind of important point is like uh, we try to break really difficult task into the like small or practical steps. So, and then we design each calculation step letter, uh, retrospectively. So this is how I design. So um, maybe I want to show um, another background before talking about the next philosophy. So there are many challenges in the gene perturbation simulation. So first, why is the gene perturbation simulation is such difficult? So first, I think like uh, the first point is difficulty in the network inference or inference part. So like we said, it's not our main goal, but I need to say it is still really um, kind of challenging task. For example, gene expression network or sorry, gene regulatory network have need to have like a, there must be some kind of many interaction between many genes. And so in order to um, think about the perturbation, we need to get the causal relationship. So we need to know what can, what gene are upstream and then what, gene, what genes are downstream, right? But uh, I think, you know, the causal infinite, causal inference or causal relationship and inference might be really challenging in general. Um, also one, uh, another difficulty is gene function or gene, regula regula sorry, gene regulation can be context dependent. So for if we know the one gene might be the upstream of another gene, such interaction can be different in another cell. So we need to think about such context dependent mechanism. Also, the second point is difficulty in the cell identity simulation itself. Uh, for example, if we think cell identity simulation, which is like, um, we, if we think about the differentiation process, which is long-term, but the future prediction or time series prediction or time like a forecasting is kind of really challenging in general, right? And then, uh, and maybe last thing is cell identity regulation involve many cellular and molecular events, not only like PF, but also maybe there might exist many, many information, many, many like interaction, like, you know, protein localization, cell, um, cell, cell interactions, something like that. So there are so many different, but really, you know, um, important difficulty in this task. So, for uh, you know, for two, so two answer to solve these difficulties, we need to uh, think about the you know 
um, you need to think about the solution. So maybe I, I, this is a really important point of our um, method implementation. Like we need to break a big challenge into a practical task. So this is what we are doing. So first for each, like for, for the causal relationship task, so we propose base GRN. So, I mean, if we use multimodal data, we can define the directionality of the gene regulation in, you know, by using the genomic information. So if we try to use, um, sorry, if we try to do causal relationship, causal, causal inference, it's kind of challenging. But uh, by using multimodal data information, multimodal data, I try to solve this problem. And uh, next, for the next one, um, I'm making a GRN model for each cluster. I mean, we are trying to break the data into small point and then try to make model for each cluster. So this is kind of cluster-wise um, GRN modeling. Um, the, for the future prediction difficulty, I'm making vector map and trajectory visualization. So I will explain the, this point later. Um, and then lastly, uh, for the calculation of the so identity simulation, I'm doing partial derivative calculation. Maybe this is kind of most important point of the Oracle. So, I mean, there are different different kinds of like challenges in the cell oracle um, simulation, but we come up with different approach to, um, to address the, this point. So the kind of general, sorry, general philosophy is we try to break the difficulty into a small task. Okay, um, for the first step, uh, incorporate vertical knowledge. So like I said before, causal inference is really challenging. For example, if you look at the these three data. So these are just two types of information, x, two variable, x and y. So it looks like they're kind of like, there exists kind of correlation between x and y. But, uh, um, you know, if you look at these two information, it's kind of hard to infer the mechanism behind the data because, you know, these three looks really similar, but actual um, data generation step is really different. For example, in one case, X might regulate one, so X is regulating gene Y. And in another case, Y is regulating X. In another case, the hidden variable Z is regulating X and, X and Y. So maybe I think it's really different, different, difficult to distinguish these three from, so, uh, from the statistical viewpoint. But uh, if we know actually they are vertical information, maybe we can tackle this, um, uh, task from different viewpoint. So here is like, I'm trying to use different information because, you know, here, like some said before, we are not trying to infer the GRN. I mean, we are not trying to do the GRN inference task. The ultimate goal of our method is trying to do simulation. So we can use the, inf what, what inform sorry, we can use any kinds of information if you think useful. So maybe you might say like it's kind of cheating, but yeah, maybe yes, but it's okay for us. So because the aim of our, of our um, viewpoint is, you know, uh, really focusing on the gene simulation. And then in that sense, maybe we, we can, we are using much more information. So, um, okay, this is one kind of big point. Um, and then next, let me introduce the mechanics, mechanics of the Oracle and actual implementation. And so, uh, okay, next. Again, let me briefly overview the Cell Oracle framework. So we are processing data sequentially. For example, first we are using RNA-seq information and attack-seq information, and then calculating a GR net structure and then doing simulation and visualization. So maybe usually in the, in the, in the typical um, conference, I'm, I'm explaining this step from the left side to the right side. But let me explain from the final point first. And then let me like explain like in the reverse order so that I can explain the how I designed the cell oracle. Okay, so what we want to know is like a, to simulate the cell identity shift um, on the gene perturbation. 
For example, here in the hematopoiesis, mouse hematopoiesis data set. Um, okay, and so in this example, we, we, I assume we already know the directionality of the differentiation. I mean, we know that the root cells for like some pseudo time of these cells. So what we try to do is cell identity simulation as a vector field. So we are like visualizing the cell identity shift vector, so which represent a small shift for each cell. Um, if we look at this point, we can see some kind of cell identity shift from left side to the right side, right? Which means the cell identity might be changing from uh, the very slow cells into the monocyte or granulocyte cells upon the GATA1 knockout simulation. Okay, and then if you look at the, another cell cluster, maybe we can see another, um, you know, another trend here. So how we are doing such simulation actually? So we are really uh, inspired by some um, previous method. For example, so this is the RNA velocity um, study uh, published um, previously. So in this analysis, they also use the um, RNA splicing information to get the cell differentiation shift when I mean, to estimate the uh, derivative of the time derivative of the spliced mRNA abundance. So for example, uh, the also analyze the splicing and I'm uh, sorry, spliced mRNA and unspliced mRNA. And then they make the model um, ordinary differentiation model, and then try to do, like uh, trying to predict the directionality of the mRNA, um, mRNA abundance. For example, uh, here, this model is trying to think about the, this gene is going to be increased or decreased um, during the differentiation. So I thought maybe we can do, we can take the kind of same strategy and then, but. But in our case, we are trying to know the relationship between gene and gene, not gene and time. So, so in our case, we are trying to, we need to know the response to the down, sorry, response of the downstream gene on the perturbation of the upstream gene. So, so Oracle uses the, the yep. There was one question online on that last slide. If uh, the degradation rate gamma um, may, if it's possible that the degradation rate gamma is not a constant, but a time dependent value. Uh, so I think in this paper, the author is inferring the gamma for each cell, um, sorry, each gene, and maybe the gamma is constant, I guess. So, but uh, in the cell oracle, we are not using the gamma parameter for the cell oracle. So maybe the calculation is kind of different. So. Um, as, so here we are, we are thinking that actually we are trying to think that this um, parameter using the GRN model, not the sparsing information. So actually, cell Oracle do not does not use um, uh, any sparsing information. So, but uh, before explaining the like, each network stuff, please let me explain the uh, sorry the the downstream analysis first. So here, what we are doing is like a correct thinking about the partial derivative of the um, gene expression, the relationship between gene and gene. For example, here, uh, let's assume that gene, um, so let's assume we already have the gene network as a um, differentiable function. So we are trying to think about, like we try to think that, you know, we're trying to think the response of gene um, between, sorry, response of gene X2 uh, based on the gene, gene expression x0. So here, trying to like know the gene, you know, partial derivative of between genes, these genes. Even if they, sorry, even if these genes are not directly connected, using the you know, chain rule, we can you know, propagate the partial derivative and then we can calculate the you know, uh, response of the gene. So this is the base, the other basic concept of cell oracle. I mean, intuitively, we are considering such something like this. For example, if we're focusing on gene expression, one single uh, gene I, gene expression in, in one cell, and then let's think, let's start thinking like uh, down regulation or down like a per, sorry, perturbation of gene I. And then 
So first, like, uh, we try to think about the really small set uh, of downstream gene, direct downstream, downstream gene. And then if we can ex estimate the direct downstream gene shift based on gene shift, we can then consider the second target gene shift. So we keep doing such kind of calculation. And then finally, we can get the vector of the gene expression similar shift. So finally, this is the kind of uh, high dimensional gene shift simulation vector. So we can get the gene shift simulation vector for each cell and then we convert these high dimensional vector information into 2D cells trajectory, um, sorry, in, into the 2D cell, cell state vector. So this is kind of, um, the looks a little bit complicated, but it, we are doing kind of similar calculation as a uh, RNA velocity on the like final um, data conversion. So maybe I need to explain using uh, some kind of illustration. So maybe, um, Okay, uh, by the way, I also want to explain the, the difference of the Oracle and the- Can I yeah. ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, can you go back two slides, please? Two Just slides. like, so how do you decide like how far down the, the, the graph to go? Is that based on like uh, the data you have and like the time that's elapsed or- uh, Yes, what so- is the, how do the effect sizes change depending on yeah, so that step? The, for the effect size is based on two information. The first thing we are considering is like a actual gene. Like, so here we are, um, before doing this calculation, we are trying to do, trying to make a GNX, GRN model as a differentiable function. So in this, in this equation, we are trying to um, estimate the relationship between one gene and another. Uh, like, uh, for example, let's say in this graph, we have like a gene graph from gene X0 to X1, which means like gene X0 might be the regulator of the gene X1. Gene X1. And then we, so here, important information is this, this one. So we can get this information from the GRN graph. So, and then, we are combining these two information to consider the more downstream gene. So, I mean, here the important gene information is coming from the GRN graph. So, if you have, you know, in the cell oracle, we are getting this, we are constructing gene graph based on the base GRN network and uh, linear um, regression. But basically, any differentiable function can be used for this calculation. So important point is we are just like a combining the partial derivative of each genes, and then we are applying the GRN model as a predictive function. So um, does it make sense? What are my question? I guess just like why is there not a dx uh, an x three in the little cartoon there? Like x two could then affect x three and and so forth down the graph. Uh, and you yeah. sort of stop it at x2. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this maybe is this like, is just the cartoon. But yeah. I think in your method too, it stops it. Mm -hmm. So weeks. in this graph, we are just calculating a small, a small number. But actually, uh, I in the later section, I will show you um, another example. Right here. Actually, we are calculating many, many steps and then compare the result. So not only two or three, but also we calculated uh, many steps and then I will show some. Result, yeah. Uh, but uh, in 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 the practical way, I mean, so in the theoretical, so you can define the number of, number of propagation in the theoretical function, so you can change the parameter. Okay, so let me um, visualize some. Um, let me show some illustration of the method. So in the like, let me compare the theoretical analysis with some kind of like a time series long-term prediction. So if you want to consider the differentiation process or cell state simulation, maybe, you know, maybe you can get some kind of model, cell identity model, and then start considering some like, a, you know, some dynamics in the, in the um, some cell identity space, right? And then sometimes it can go into like this, 
but sometimes it go into a different way. So, I mean, if you try to do time series prediction, kind of the difficulty is the, you know, the process is long and then prediction can be really challenging because some future prediction is really difficult, especially for the really long-term prediction, right? And then error might be accumulating. And then also some, um, another difficulty is the gene, gene regulatory network structure itself can be changed over the you know, such um, differentiation process. So um, that's in the cell oracle, of course we are using the G, GRM model, but we are only considering just small, really tiny, tiny amount of the sift here. And then focusing on another cell type, we considering small sift again. But in, the, in this case, we are using the cell state specific GRM model. So maybe the effect is might be, sorry, the prediction direction might be different. And then we are repeating such calculation for each cell type in, in the data set. So this is like a really small estimation. And then it does not make sense if you look at just single cell data, but by combining such really, uh, you know, small amount of calculation, um, you know, individual's estimation might not make sense. But if you look at the global structure, it starts making sense. Each small calculation is really tiny. And then we say like, uh, we intentionally doing that because like long-term calculation might be more challenging. So this is why we are trying to focus on really small amount of shift. And then we are doing like um, cell state specific GRN modeling so that we can capture cell state specific gene perturbation effect. And then we are trying to avoid long-term prediction, which is really challenging. Um, uh, okay, and uh, maybe going next. So here, uh, sorry, it's really important in terms of the in terms of the like modeling. So this is kind of like um, you know, we are trying to make model and then do prediction. So which is something like machine learning, right? Um, actually, we are using linear model. Maybe it's too simple to say like machine learning, but uh, it's so we are trying to make model and then doing prediction. So. <laughs> If we try to do like out of distribution prediction, which might be kind of not that good, right? So, uh, but here we are just trying to simulate really small shift. So the here we are showing the the blue distrib uh, the distribution of the gene expression in the blue, which is the original gene expression value, and the orange also we are showing the gene expression plus simulated shift. So. We, I'm now showing the simulated gene expression shift after the PU1 gene perturbation. So in most cases, the simulated value, I mean, simulated shift is really tiny. So actually the distribution is almost identical as the original one, so not identical, really similar to the original one. So, I mean, I wanna say we are not doing out of distribution simulation, which is you know, not good for the machine learning task. Um, but e even if each step is really tiny, we are connecting information together. And then we are, if we visualize the, if we visualize the simulated shift in, on the trajectory space, which makes sense because we are looking at clear pattern, like, you know, one cell type going to another. And then, which means like, uh, if, for example, in the GATA1 case, if you look at the GATA1 gene, maybe cell state might change from an cell site state to the mon site state or you know, some here. So, I mean, the important point is we are trying to do like really difficult task breaking down into the, I mean, sorry, we are trying to break down the really challenging task into small, simpler task. Um, also here, maybe I need to show some kind of variation for example, um, uh, yeah, here uh, in the left panel, I'm showing the typical cell oracle simulation result, which is showing GATA1 knockout simulation. We can see cell state shift from uh, like here from rest side to the light side, which means like a cell state can be changing from the aerosolized state to the you know, 
granular site and um, mon site state. But uh, here, the, the center panel is showing the G cell oracle simulation with randomized GRN. So if we do not use GRN um, information, I mean, we, we just calculating a gene, gene, sorry, cell state vector um, using a randomized GRN. So, you know, everything looks like really messy and then we cannot get the simulation effect. And also the, on the right side, we are showing the GATA1 knockout simulation vector without signal propagation. So which means like a signal propagation step is just zero. So which means we are just try to visualize the cell state shift uh, only using the GATA1 information itself. So here we also not seeing any effect here. So which means like a signal propagation step is really um, important for visualizing the cell uh, state vector. So like using such signal propagation, we're trying to simulate the global downstream effect. Sorry, um, I said I will show, I will answer that your question later, but uh, I, today I think I might not have that slide. So I repeated um, the, sorry, I did some similar um, simulation for different number of the sorry, uh, signal propagation count. But usually I get the uh, saturation at the signal propagation at like N equals three or something. So this is why we are trying to do like a signal propagation at like some more, some more number of genes. I mean, it, we can repeat calculating for like a, you know, a hundred or something, but uh, it does not, it did not change the result. Okay, so let me show another variation kind of. So here we are trying to use different cell trajectory. So in the previous section, some get some got a question like, uh, how did you do if you um, did not know the you know, trajectory information or root cell information? So here, for example, if you get the different trajectory about different trajectory information, so what happens? I, I compare the result, for example, Usually I recommend using like a force directed graph because which um, many cases which will give you more like sharp, um, more clear trajectory structure. And then we can see some uh, shift here from the erythroid to the um, monocyte, big monocyte cell type here. But even if you use the different trajectory inference method like UMAP or TSNI, we can see kind of similar trend. Maybe it might be kind of, um, difficult to see the small vector here, but uh, we can see the shift from this state, this little side state to the GMP state here. So, I mean, if you get really clear or better um, trajectory, it will help you interpret the result. But still, we can get similar trends in, even if you can, you even if you are using the different trajectory inference method. And of course, if you have different um, pseudo time information, your like um, perturbation score might be might be different. So it it's one as a one of the limitation. So Oracle is using the trajectory inference structure and pseudo time information, so the result can be changed. But if you look at the biological, uh, if you try to in, in, interpret the biological meaning. Maybe you can get the similar biological interpretation, I think. Uh, but also like some in, if the trajectory is not showing some like information, for example, here, uh, sorry, in the force directed, directed graph, we can see like clear difference between the granular site and monocyte cluster. But in the T-SNE, the, you know, the structure of the granular site and monocyte lineage might be unclear. So in that case, we lose some information between these two cell type shift, I think. Um, okay, and in the previous um, in the previous section, I explained about the partial derivative calculation. So I said we need to get some kind of differentiable function. So we need to get GRN network as a differentiable function. So this is one requirement for the um, GRN model for the cell oracle. So by the way, how can we get the GRN model as a differential function? So yeah, this is the maybe last thing I want to explain. 
So first, we need to construct the GRN as a directional graph, not you know, bidirectional graph. And then it needs need to be differentiable. So, I mean, first, we need to get the you know, directional graph so we can, sorry, which means we need to define the you know, upstream gene and downstream gene. So here we are using ataxic data to define the, you know, uh, to, to get the information about causal, um, causal relationship. So maybe I don't explain the detail because some already explained about this step. So, but first step, we need, we start using ataxic data to get the information about TF binding. So if you use ataxic data, we can get the open accessible peak in the DNA, gen genomic DNA. So which means like we can get active promoter and active enhancer information. And then using the TF binding um, database, we try to search what kind of TF can be bind to this um, open accessible peak. So, and then we can define the potentially binding TF to this target gene. So this is kind of first step of the cell recursion and reconstruction. So we get the candidate gene that regulates the downstream gene. And then in the next step, we are just trying to get the regression model. So this is kind of like a easy, um, very easy calculation. So in the previous, like uh, in the previous study, people are using like um, more, uh, more, I mean, more um, kind of sophisticated, more different, sorry, different model like um, random forest or some you know, neural network or something to infer the gene, gene to gene connection. But here we are just using a linear regression model. So we have reason. So first we need to do, we need to get, we need to use like a differentiable, um, sorry, we need to use differentiable um, function. So this is the, and linear regression might be more easiest differentiable function. So if you want to use a um, more complicated model or more sophisticated model, you can substitute this part with like deep neural network or whatever. But the uh, important point is we try to make the regression model based on the TF potential regulator and try to predict the downstream target gene. So here you are, we are using single cell RNA seq data. Um, and another important point is we are trying to make this model for each cell cluster to um, consider the um, nonlinear relationship, um, even if it's the linear model. Okay, maybe I want to go to the final part, basic assumption and limitation of the oracle. So um, I want to explain the limitation and assumption from the viewpoint of method development. Not application. So first, I think the maybe the one of the important thing is the the first point. So I think I'm thinking that inferred network is incomplete. This is one like a kind of basic assumption because you know there are so many different and so many great methods have been developed uh, has been developed, and then I like I like them, but still I think most of the inferred network are still incomplete, I guess. So, and then if you try to do some downstream analysis, we need to make a kind of robust model for the downstream analysis. So then Cerakul is like trying to think about cell identity simulation, cell identity. So Cerakul is not trying to do the, not trying to predict the gene expression level for each gene, but rather we are trying to predict the cell identity simulation, which might be more easier, I think. So Cerorac will intentionally limit the simulation output. This is the one important point. Uh, and then second important point is our simulation is calculating the derivative, partial derivative. So which is representing relatively small shift. So it's not aiming for a long-term or you know, it's not aiming for the long-term simulation. So we are just calculating a really small shift. And the next point is Cerorac model are based on the you know, um, transcriptional regulation, trans intrin cell intrinsic transcriptional regulation. So which means we are not considering cell-cell interaction or another biological information, right? So, I mean, if you say like, um, if 
you know, by focusing on the transcription regulation, maybe we can do some kind of simulation. But if your interest, or if your biological event are really you know, related to another important factor like protein-protein interaction or some cell death or proliferation or something like that event, maybe cell oracle prediction might not be accurate, I guess. So, I mean, again, cell oracle does not include other information like cell proliferation, cell death, or cell cell interaction like that. So we are just focusing on cell intrinsic trans transcriptional factor regulation. So maybe we can say like in the future, or if you combine another information, we can consider, you can start considering such information. Um, but currently we are not thinking about that. Maybe this is kind of limitation. Also, we can say this is kind of one future direction we can go further. Um, and summary, as a summary, so we started from a biological data set and by integrating them, trying to consider, like trying to make the GRN model. So this is the first step. And then for the next step, so we are trying to simulate the actual cell behavior based on the network model. So which is the, I think, most important point um, because, uh, sorry, uh, then, so as a whole, the Oracle it constructs GR model from focusing on the simulation and then cell behavior. So it's really important to say like, we are focusing on simulation and then by thinking about the simulation and prediction, which tell us, which, you know, which guide us how to make GR model. So this is how I designed the cell oracle. And then also, if you look at the, you know, if you define your um, requirement for the uh, GR model, which guide you, guide us, um, what kind of data set do we need? So this is like everything is more kind of reverse um, way. I designed cell oracle based on the simulation. And then you know, everything can be uh, um, sent, um, revolving around the GRN simulation. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, this is uh, my talk. Thank you so much. So this is our lab. Thank you so much um, for listening. <laughs>